Welcome to our Thursday Bible study. We're continuing our study of Solomon using First and Second Chronicles. Today our study is focusing on the pillars in the house of God. The, one of the elements of the construction of the temple, the two pillars that Solomon constructed that were placed at the front of the temple. The temple being a place for worship, a place where people came together to offer sacrifices, to offer their lives to God. As we sing together today, I invite you to join us as we sing, Stand Up and Bless the Lord. We come to worship God. Join us as we sing. singing. By singing, we are called to be God's people. Hear the words of this first verse. We are called to be God's people, showing by our lives His grace. In one in heart and one in spirit, sign of hope for all the race. Let us show how He has changed us and remade us for His own. Let us share our life together as we shall around His throne. Oh, yeah. 
you continue our study of Solomon, no ordinary kind of wisdom. This is session four. And the title of the lesson we're going to be looking at today is Pillars in the House of God, taken from 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. The temple has been constructed, and as we have studied over these past weeks, there's great detail in what materials were gathered, the dimensions and specifications for everything from the stone that was crafted to materials and objects that were created with fabrics that skilled laborers were enlisted, but also many unskilled workers were used so that they could maximize the effort so that construction of this temple could continue. The plans were detailed down to the smallest of specifications. Measurements were laid out and done precisely. Seems in some cases maybe even more precisely than some of the measurements and construction that is done in our day and our time. The other thing that's important for us to remember is that every element in the structure of the temple was there for a purpose. It was there for the purpose of enhancing the worship of God of experiencing the presence of God. The last elements to be put together were the two pillars that we're going to talk about today. Two pillars that were placed on the outside of the vestibule area of the temple. This temple in Jerusalem was the religious heart of the nation and it was the place of pilgrimage for Jews throughout the world. It was the place where people would gather for worship and celebration and feasting. Not that that was the only place where God existed, that you had to only go to the temple to experience God because God could not be contained as we talked about last week. God wasn't contained only in the place of the temple. He was with the people everywhere they were, but the temple became the focal point for their worship. It was the place that on feast times and during festivals, that as many as could, the Jews would come and they would gather in Jerusalem. And they, they would offer sacrifices. They would come together for worship. They would come together for feast days. Here, 2 Chronicles, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David was des designated, had designated on the threshing floor of Ormon, the Jebusite. He began to build on the second day of the second month of the fourth year of his reign. These are Solomon's measurements for building the house of God. The length in cubits of the old standard was 60 cubits and the width 20 cubits. The vestibule in front of the, in front of the nave of the house was 20 cubits long across the width of the house and its height was 120 cubits. He overlaid it on the inside with pure gold. The nave he lined with cypress, covered it with fine gold, and made palms and chains on it. He adorned the house with settings of precious stones. The gold was gold from Parvaim. So he lined the house with gold, its beams, its thresholds, its walls, and its doors, and he carved cherubim on the walls. He made the most holy place, its length corresponding to the width of the house, and tw was 20 cubits, and its width was 20 cubits. 
He overlaid it with 600 talents of fine gold. The weight of the nails was 50 shekels of gold. He overlaid the upper chambers with gold. In the most holy place he made two carved cherubim and overlaid them with gold. The wings of the cherubim together extended 20 cubits. One wing of the one five cubits long touched the wall of the house and, the, and its other wing five cubits long touched the wing of the other cherub. And this cherub, one wing, five cubits long, touched the wall of the house, and the other wing, also five cubits long, was joined to the wing of the first cherub. The wings of these cherubim extended twenty cubits. The cherubim stood on their feet, facing the nave. And Solomon made the curtain of blue and purple and crimson fabrics and fine linen and worked cherubim into it. In front of the house he made two pillars. 35 cubits high, with a capital of five cubits on top of each. He made encircling chains and put them on the tops of the pillars, and he made 100 pomegranates and put them on the chains. He set up the pillars in front of the temple, one on the right, the other on the left. The one on the right he called Jochen, and the other, the one on the left, Boaz. Solomon built the house of God on sacred ground, ground that was sacred to his father David. The name of that mount was Mount Moriah. This is the location where Abraham was tested by God and God provided a lamb for the sacrifice instead of Abraham sacrificing his only son, Isaac. Mount Moriah was the location where David had built an altar to God. This location was a landmark reminding the people of God's faithfulness. So it's significant that the temple was built on Mount Moriah because it was a place where God's faithfulness was evident. You'll notice in the reading of that passage that Solomon began the building of this temple in the fourth year of his reign. It wasn't the first thing he did. That initial four years, those initial years of his reign, were taken up with establishing his rule, gathering the resources, finalizing the plans, ensuring that the temple that was being constructed would glorify God fully. This temple was the most extravagant house. It was the most extravagant representation of God's majesty. It was important for Solomon that the people would see this God, that their, their God was greater than the gods of other people. But this also was a, was a temple built so that other people would see that the God of the people of Israel was greater than any of their gods, that this was truly the largest feat of architecture in the world at the time. It had the most, it, it, it was larger. It had more gold. It had the most luxurious interior design. No detail was left to chance. Every detail was followed to the letter. Solomon wanted this temple to resemble what he believed heaven would look like. He wanted to create the most suitable place for the worship of God. He created a temple that was, could be described with really only the word is massive. The dimensions 
are beyond anything that had ever been constructed before. The foundation is 60 cubits by 20 cubits. If we turn that into uh, something that makes a little more sense to us in measurements, 87 feet 6 inches, so 87 and a half feet by 29 feet. This was a very large temple. The vestibule itself, the entry point into the temple, was 20 cubits wide and 120 cubits high. That's extremely tall isn't it? It is an amazing structure. This building was immense and overshadowed anything that had been seen before. The other thing that you will notice as you, as you read this scripture is there's a lot of gold. Gold overlay was used in every place. This was pure gold. Wood was covered with gold. To a, an element, whether it be the cherubim on the walls or the palms and chains that decorated the pillars, gold was covering each and every item. The other thing that we know from the construction of the t and design of the temple is that the Holy of Holies was at the rear of the building. The Holy of Holies is the place that the Ark of the Covenant would be placed. It was a place that only the high priest could enter. It was a place that created separation between God and human contact. And there would be this curtain that would, that, that would be placed in front of this holy of holies so that you could not see inside. This was the most holy place. And then there were two pillars standing in front of the temple. These two pillars were the last thing to be placed. In 1 Kings chapter 7, verses 15 through 22, we see another description of these temples. 1 Kings chapter 7, verses 15 through 22. He cast two pillars of bronze. 18 cubits was the height of one and the cord of 12 cubits would encircle it. The second pillar was the same. He also made capitals of molten bronze and set on the tops of the pillars. The height of the one capital was five cubits and the height of the other capital was five cubits. There were nets of checker work with wreaths of chain work for the capitals on the tops of the pillars. Seven for the one capital and seven for the other capital. He made the columns with two rows around each latticework to cover the capitals that were above the pomegranates. He did the same with the other capital. Now the capitals were on the tops of the pillars in the vestibule were of lily work, four cubits high. The capitals were on the two pillars and also above the rounded projection that was beside the latticework where there were 200 pomegranates in rows all around and so with the other capital. He set up the pillars at the vestibule of the temple. He set up the pillar on the south and called it Jochen, and he set up the pillar on the north and called it Boaz. On the tops of the pillars was lily work. Thus, the work of the pillars was finished. In 1 Kings, we see a description with a few more details different details than the chronicler gave us in 2 Chronicles. Another element that, that is important is the cherubim. 
designed especially for the Holy of Holies. The veil that is woven using the finest linen with images of, images of the cherubim woven into it. Solomon did an amazing job creating the temple for Yahweh. The pillars became the final element and set the building apart from other temples. And it's important to note that the pillars were to use, were normally in a building, pillars would be used for additional support. But in Solomon's temple, they were there for decoration. They were there to set this temple apart, but they were not essential for the temple to stand. They were put in last. In most construction, pillars would be included to have decorative features, and Solomon did have de decorative pillars. When we think about pillars, and we think about pillars in, in other scripture references, we also might want to think of Lot's wife, who became as a pillar of salt when she turned to look back to the destruction of the cities, to the land where they had lived. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, the victorious Christian is described as a pillar in the temple of God. Solomon constructed two pillars that stood 57 feet high. Freestanding pillars that were decorated with chains like necklaces and pomegranates. All of, all of that imagery being chosen and, and created to have meaning. This wasn't just he liked chains and pomegranates, but it was meaning for life and connection. The placement of these pillars completed the construction of the temple. And then Solomon did something that sounds a little unusual maybe for us. He named those pillars. Jochen and Boaz. Jochen meaning firm, upright, and stable. Steadfast might be a word that we would, that, that could capture part of the meaning for the word jockin. The other column is named Boaz, which means power, might, and strength. That these pillars are constructed and placed and named to represent the strength and faithfulness of God. These pillars provided extra support, but they were not necessary for the church to stand. Let's put this into terms that maybe brings it forward to us and to our witness and our lives as Christians. And thinking about ourselves as pillars that God wants us to stand steadfast and strong as a witness to his faithfulness. The church is stronger with us. To be clear, God doesn't need us, but he wants us to be a part of his work. As Christians, we are called by God to serve him in every, every aspect of our lives and to the best of our abilities. That the places of worship, our churches, our synagogues, our temples, are sacred places that, that both accommodate and facilitate that divine human encounter that we have between God and God's people. As with Solomon's temple, our places of worship 
have elements that have meaning for us, that remind us of God's presence, not just in this place, but in our lives. That God is not just here with us in our congregations, in our buildings. He was not just in the temple that Solomon had created, but that Solomon's temple was dedicated to the worship of God to the offering of sacrifices, to demonstrating the greatness of God, that does translate to us. That God is with us where we are. But we come together to worship together. That in these sacred places, to serve God, to worship Him, and to go out to serve him in the world. When we look at, at our sanctuaries, when we think about our church buildings, there are symbols that we see that remind us of God and his presence and his faithfulness. Many, if not most, of our congregations of our buildings have crosses somewhere. The cross being a reminder, whether it be a Protestant cross or whether it be a crucifix, that that is a reminder of God's faithfulness, of God's love by sending his son. The sacraments, as we gather together for communion, for baptism, to remember. The images in our stained glass windows, in the design of our sanctuaries with typically roofs that point us to the sky, Godward. In the artwork, that is included in our sanctuaries and in our buildings. When we think of pillars of the church, we probably don't think of physical pillars, although some of our buildings have pillars. We think of someone who strengthens the entire body of Christ, of persons as pillars, of Christ. Someone who walks in the strength and endurance of God, who reminds others by their example to be faithful, who remind others that God is present with us even in uncertain times in our lives. In the New Testament, Pillars of the church included Peter and John and Timothy and James because they dedicated their lives to serving and strengthening the church as role models for the early Christians. Role models of what it means to live faithful, committed Christian lives. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 through 21, we read about a new temple. Ephesians 2, chapter, uh, verses 17 through 21. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both, both of us have access to one spirit in the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place of God. Paul says in Ephesians that God is constructing a new temple, one not made of stones and arches and pillars and altars, but it's a temple of people, of us. 
that this new temple would be communities where God would take up residence. For Christians, the church building is not a temple. The people are the place where God resides. And as those verses remind us, the cornerstone of that building is Jesus. Who are the pillars of the church you have known? What made them pillars of strength and faithfulness? How did their example impact your life? I'd like to share with you one of the pillars of faith from my own experience. I want to introduce to you a person that I consider to be a pillar of the church from my childhood and even into my adulthood. At Clifton Baptist Church, one of the faces that immediately comes to mind when I think of a pillar of the church is Mae Simpson. May was a single, never married leader of the church. She was not one who was in charge of committees or the person who stood out as a spokesperson for any particular group. She was the director of the Junior Two, there was Junior One and Junior Two, department in Sunday school. That was the fifth and sixth graders. She was also the poet laureate for the church and was supportive of the church in any way she possibly could, most of the time behind the scenes. I think of her first as the director of the junior Sunday school department. In that role, she provided direction and encouragement to countless children, valuing each one and making everyone welcome. She was gentle, but firm. We were a somewhat unique department of fifth and sixth graders. There were preacher's kids and deacon's kids and neighborhood kids and residents from the Kentucky School for the Blind. Our church was fortunate that we were the primary church at that time, that students from the School for the Blind would come on Sundays for church. At that time, the students would go home once a month and the other three Sundays, they would be with us in Sunday school and in worship. So we had, a, we had quite a unique collection, gathering of fifth and sixth graders in that department. As I watched, I saw this pillar value each person for who they were. She accepted them without conditions, without saying, it's nice that you are who you are, but I need you to become somebody else. Or I need you to fit into a particular box or act in a specific way. Instead, she welcomed all. She also was one who encouraged us to lead. So as we were able, we would do things like play the piano or read scripture or pray during the opening assembly. She was one of those persons that I would call gifted because she was able to find value and bring out the value in each person. She led us in ways that made us want to follow. We weren't following her. She was following God and we were following her, which meant we were also following where God was leading. May Simpson was dedicated to those children, especially those who may not have had family who attended worship services with them. And she welcomed the opportunity to have children sit with her. They weren't her biological children, but we were all her children. 
she would invite children to sit with her and she would guide them through the worship experience. As I said, she was poet laureate for the church, which meant she was a wordsmith. She crafted poetry for every conceivable opportunity. Sometimes it was birthdays for staff. Sometimes it was a special event in the life of the church. We were recognizing and celebrating the life of our church, and she was able to capture that through her poems. The thing that always came out, especially in those poems that were written in honor of my father, she had quite of the wit and wisdom and was able to create poems that not only captured the essence of the persons who were focused on, but she also captured a sense of humor that was probably a little bit unexpected from her. She was a special friend to many, and one of those persons was my mother. Even after May was in a long-term care facility and no longer able to be in our worship service, the two of them continued a years-long writing, letter-writing relationship. I still have some of those letters. Another thing about May that stood out is that the job that she had for decades was with a Jewish organization in the downtown area. And at this, po this point in time, I don't remember exactly which one it was. But her employer greatly appreciated what she brought to work each day, each Monday through Friday, her organizational skills and her leadership skills. May was somebody that if you were just picking out from a group of persons, probably not somebody that you would say is a pillar of the church, a pillar of faithfulness and strength, because it wasn't as if in that crowd, in that group, she would immediately stand out. But I am confident that as in my eyes, she is a pillar of the church in the eyes of many people who were fortunate to know her. She was a worker doing what needed to be done, caring for people who were otherwise cast aside and inviting others to minister with her. She was gifted at bringing out the best in other people, encouraging them to be faithful and to stand strong. A testimony to that faithfulness became clear that when she retired from this Jewish organization, they wanted to, to make a gift to May's church to remember and to honor all that she had meant to them. The gift was a new set of communion plates, one that we actually needed. But what was so important was that this was something that would have meaning not only to May, but more importantly to the life of the church that she was so dedicated to. And it is important. This is a Jewish organization rep and giving something that talks about the death and resurrection of Christ, which is not part of their belief system. May was, for me, a pillar of faithfulness and strength for many reasons and stands out. May we be strong pillars, giving witness to God's strength and his faithfulness. May we be an example of courageous leaders 
And may our prayer be that God would mold us into pillars of his church. Will you pray with me? Our Father, you are our Lord. You are majestic. You call us your people. You call us to be faithful. And as your church, to give witness to the world through our lives, through our example, that you truly are love. As we remember the pillars that were placed in Solomon's temple and the pillars of the church for which we give thanks, those who have been instrumental in our lives, that may we then continue as pillars of your church to go and tell to share the good news, to be examples of your faithfulness, your strength, and your love. Amen. May we go out in the name of the Lord to stand as pillars for the world to see. As we love one another, do justice, show kindness, and walk humbly with our God. Amen and Amen.